to the Mindset Michelle TV show. We're so super excited to have you joining us again for this week's episode and so super excited for all of the fabulous feedback we've been receiving about how much you're enjoying the show and how much it's making a difference in your life for creating a positive mindset in your world. And today we have this extra, extra special guest, a bit like the Yoda of the mindset space, someone that I admired for many, many years and someone that I can truly hand on heart say has dedicated his life to this space. So hello and welcome, Alan. Michelle, it's a joy to be with you. I'm thrilled. Fabulous. So Alan Parker, for the very few of you that I'm sure that may not have heard of him, is a very, very experienced person in this neuro-linguistic programming mindset space. In fact, he's a micro-behavioral scientist and he has studied so many different areas that I want him to explain to us. But I wanted to start with that sense that he is a gentleman that has dedicated his life and has made it a passion to study these micro behaviors, study how people interact and how the world interacts with people and share and then dedicate this knowledge with others, whether it's through workshops or through negotiation with the United Nations, supporting them as well. In many different ways, he's dedicated his life to sharing this knowledge. But Alan, please, how, how did you get into this and, and share with people what is a microbehavioral scientist? Oh, thank you, Michelle. Um, how, I, how did I get into it? I fell into it, really. Um, but if I can go right back to the very early stage, I, um, I was born with a particular eye problem that meant I didn't read until I was 30, three zero. I did my first two degrees auditorily assisted. And I had a turning point in 1982 where I had a whole, an introduction to somebody who understood how the brain worked and how we learned. And within a week, I doubled my reading speed. Wow. Within a week. And that started me on a journey because when you can't read and then one day something happens and you can, now, when I say I can, I went from being a 52-word-a-minute reader with less than 50% comprehension. So it's, it's way under the... I was technically illiterate. And then within, I met Dr. Paul Dennison at San Diego University in 82, and within a day, I doubled my reading speed. Wow, that that, that's an purely, incredible increase. That was purely through two things, Michelle. He gave me eye exercises and he demonstrated to me the power of positive and optimistic thought. And when we put those two things together, I had a neurological change take place. And that set me on a journey of I've been a, a student of neuroscience and behavioral science, particularly in the area of micro behavior, um, ever since. So it's, it's, this is my 40th year of being, of being a nerd and a constant bookworm to discover what makes us think and how we think and what choices and control we have in the process every minute. <laughs> And this is where I really understand that your view then on what success means for you and for others might, again, have that slightly different approach to it because you understand much more than most about the control we have on defining what success mm. might be mm. and that mindset around success. So in your world, how do you then define success? Wow. Um, now I'm going to be unusual here. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a micro behavioral neuroscientist, my interest in the world is what happens in this three seconds, Michelle. So when you ask me a question, I'm going to be here and go, how's that applicable right now? And what are the choices I have? in how I respond. And so I think success is when I can 300 times during a day 
go, this is a critical choice point. Do I view this optimistically or pessimistically? Do I embrace this as a chance for me to learn? Do I see this moment as a moment of joy or possibility? Do I consider this a moment for you and me to connect at a different level? And too frequently, I think we think across time and we want to be happy for all this time or I want to be successful for all this time. And my, you know, that whole adage of how do you eat an elephant, it's, it's one bite at a time. I think when micro behaviour means what can I do in this moment. Now, if you watch each time I say something and you give me a head nod, I pause. And that's to receive the head nod. Now that time you put a smile with the head nod. So I go, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I become so present and so aware of you and what you're doing that I can design me to compliment you and me. And one of the elements I noticed in that is that success is also you are giving yourself the space and the time because you're speaking and moving with quite precise mo motions and speaking with quite precise words. Yes. So you are giving, you're, you're gifting yourself that time to be present in that choice point about how you are reacting and how you are choosing the thoughts, the motions, the actions. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And, and so this, this is an incredible um, way of looking at success. And, and the other part that I really heard there was around the three seconds instead of success being over my whole life. <laughs> Am I or aren't I? <laughs> Am I or aren't I? <laughs> Well, up until last week, I was a few success, but now I'm not all. Yes. Up until last week, I wasn't, and now I am because, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I love as well the element there about you are controlling what you define as success. Yeah. It's that very inherent um, choice around it. Yeah. I think it's, it's really important, Michelle, for us to, to actually – understand if I can be a neuroscience ball for a minute, if we could just understand that most people think we change how we are and what we do and what we say and what we think and what we feel because of what we think. And I suggest that that is an element, but the most important element is how do we actually think? Now that, could be as simple as, do I think quickly or slowly? Yeah. Do I take the time to think before I speak? And if I do, do I ma match my thinking with the pause so that I've got time to take a breath? Because if I'm going to change how I think, oxygen is the most important substance in our brain and as long as i pause and breathe often enough i'll get oxygen into my brain and the oxygen michelle combines with glucose and essentially the oxygen burns the glucose and produces brain energy and physical energy now if i'm not breathing enough and i'm rushed and i'm stressed and i'm busy and i'm just catching taking short breaths really quickly, um, I'm not getting enough oxygen in there to burn the glucose. Now, the magical thing about glucose is that once the oxygen and the glucose join, they produce energy, and the glucose becomes and produces a thing called glutamate. And glutamate is a neurotransmitter. So it's a, it's a carrier of information in the brain that produces our clearest thought. Wow, I, I love how you're describing that um, even the action of just pausing and breathing, mm -hmm. th those two things can really help people to then become more aware of their thoughts 
become more aware of the choice points around those thoughts. Yep. And, and the oxygen element helps with the clarity around the thinking yep. as well. Yeah. The, yep. These are incredibly um, useful total, tools. Total science and biology. Yeah. And and a, lot then people, I, I, a lot of people think the success around how we think and how we be, respond and how we change our mindset is to do with psychology. Yeah. But I would put it to you that the first step is biology. If we have water, oxygen and glucose, the brain can do its work. So if I haven't eaten enough or I haven't drunk enough or I'm not breathing enough, I, my thinking processes will be reduced. So if I can get those simple things in place, it makes a difference. And, and you reminded me of the um, comments from parents, you know, if you get angry, count to five before you speak or react. Um, if you're upset, take a deep breath, you know, before you react. So there's wisdom, if you like, it has been around and is there in society, but it's not necessarily the physical and the neuroscience around it isn't understood about, well, that there's actually a, a, a biological reason why this works and, and why it works so effectively. Yeah. And Michelle, two other bits that you add to that simple equation, and they seem almost like opposites, is sleep. Because there's very, a lot of science to show that if we sleep well and our brain goes into deep sleep and then REM sleep, which is when our eyes move a lot and we're dreaming and thinking, and then it drops back into deep sleep. If I can go into deep sleep and REM sleep a couple of times during the night, my brain will sort out all of the things that it's been wrestling with during the day. Now, if I add to that that I do exercise, I've got clear thought the exercise will produce what's called serotonin and endorphins, which will make me feel happy, joyful, and lift my spirit. So they're the, they're the elements. Food, oxygen, water, exercise, and sleep. Wow, and, and, and who thought that we'd be talking about nutrition <laughs> <laughs> and the things that a, a personal trainer might actually talk about as well as yeah. the keys to a successful yeah. mindset. Yeah. And, and yeah. Th these are fabulous, fabulous insights, but I know that many people watching and, and people that are watching the show are, are really looking for as well some of those um keys to keeping that positive focus on the mindset yeah. so say they take a breath and they pause and they breathe in the oxygen yeah. and then their mind is still in a sense um doing cyclic thinking or something and yeah. and and as much as they want to think about well how can i do this positive how can it work out you know i've just had a bad meeting with my boss or my yeah. um my creditors are chasing me for money how can they reframe their brain to keep going the what if sort of thing? What if or how if or how can I be positive about this? Yeah, Michelle, I'm, I'm going to answer your question and see if I can stick with some biology. <laughs> if, if, you and I, if you and I were to every hour stop at 55 minutes, get up from what we're doing, walk out the door and go outside and get fresh air and oxygen, walk for three minutes and then walk back into the building, we'd increase our breathing, we'd reduce our blood pressure, we'd reduce our pulse rate, and the, we'd increase the pulse rate, reduce the blood pressure, and we'd have more oxygen going through the system, we'd have stimulated serotonin, and now I'm in a positive state to think about paying the debt. And I'm going to have brain chemistry operating that's have, that will produce clearer thought. And I'll walk back in going, oh, I actually feel better. Um, serotonin is the chemical that pro is produced in your brain and in your body that produces the best production of passive information in and out of our brain. And it's triggered by exercise. Now, see, I only need to, you watch, I move 
and I deliberately gesticulate regularly. That's my way of giving myself a trickle of serotonin. Mm. Now, when we get really stressed, what do we do? We freeze. And we switch off the serotonin and we pump adrenaline and cortisol. And adrenaline and cortisol, Michelle, are the two substances, number one, that's addictive in our bodies. And the world is addicted to adrenaline and cortisol. It's why we have the drama and the catastrophes that we have. We could stop watching television. <laughs> and I mean commercial television that has those rumbling noises. And yeah, yeah, don't stop watching the show. <laughs> and everything's distorted and everything's a struggle and everything's traumatic. Um, the exaggeration in our thinking that takes place is often unproductive. But if I just move on a regular basis, I'm actually using up the adrenaline that produces the stress. And, and again, um, you know, I, I keep thinking as you're talking about all of these, in a sense, old wives' tales or old habits that have been around, you know, like if you're upset, get up and go for a walk yep. and clear your head, yep. um, that you're describing so eloquently and beautifully the yep. science behind it. So, yep. you know, the serotonin and, and the, the oxygen into the system yep. and the nervous system and clearing out the adrenaline and cortisol and, and yep. all of those elements that lead to clearer thinking Mm. that then helps you to look at the situation and to come back with that that positive mindset or positive focus. Mm. Well, before mm. I went for a walk, I, I felt like I couldn't see an answer to this. I've gone for a walk and nothing's changed, but now I can see more answers and more options yes. to this. Yes. Now, uh, if I can do two things with that one, one is to explain, because you said I went for a walk and I can see more answers. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I'm visual, yes. <laughs> I can see more answers. No, I can see the answers because the back part of my brain, which is called the visual cortex, it's actually, once you go for a walk, you've stimulated the visual cortex and it does the better thinking than your nervous mind chatter. And when we go for a walk and walk around for a while, we notice that that mind chatter that can drive us crazy reduces. Uh, and you do see more answers. Yeah. Now, the other, I want to diverge a little into the world of negotiation and dispute resolution, which you know is where I, I do my professional work. And um, there's a movement around the globe called walk and talk. In the world of dispute resolution, part of it is I, frequent, in fact, I've been working with two very executives who are very much at war and have been for quite a while. And every time I turn up to work with them, I just go, okay, off we go. And they go, now we go, we've got an office book. No, no, we're not going into an office. We're actually going for a walk. And we go for a walk, Michelle, and I walk with one of them each side of me. And we have a chat. But as we walk, why am I doing that? I want them breathing, I want serotonin, because they'll feel better. Okay, back to your question, what is success? It's me being able to feel better, and here's the other bit, leave the people I'm with better every time I'm with somebody. And, so and, and isn't that so powerful? It, it's from as simple as walking so that you get the oxygen going, you get the serotonin going, yep. um, walking you also turn on the visual cortex so that you yep. have more options and Absolutely. it produces that serotonin for that happy pill. Um, yep. And I love your, your description there of using it when you go walking for negotiations and, and for helping people that may be entrenched in some ways. Yeah. Yep. Now, essentially, when I've got them inside of me, they can't be at each other. Because yeah. if you notice, people get at each other when they, they do direct contact. And I go, Michelle, you just can't do that. And we all <laughs> we go toward each other. And I go, no, we've just got to be apart. 
Now they say something and I go, oh, did you hear what he, did you hear what he? So I become, I become the conduit. Now, as soon as I get them speaking and exchanging each other, and like you're doing with me, I take what they say and paraphrase it and give it back to them. And it means they've heard it now twice in two different ways, which means they're more likely to have got it, more receptive, and because they got it two different ways, it went to two different parts of the brain, so they're more likely to remember it. Now, the interesting thing when I'm walking and I can hear them agreeing on something, I stop and go, did I just hear you guys? Did you? Is that what, have I heard that correctly? And I do this and they looked at each other and they agree. And I go, oh, that's handy. Let's keep going. Let's explore something else. So we walk and talk to get the relaxed response and to create a flow of conversation and dialogue not argument and debate. Michelle, the world's addicted to argument and debate. And the danger of that is if I do it in externally in the world with other people, when I'm on my own, I then do argument and debate with me. And that monologue takes over. And that so lovely ties back to my questioning, and you're such a genius at this, around if if somebody is, is wanting to have that positive focus and, and wanting to shift, then one of the things is also looking at what are they creating in that outer world in terms of debate or, or drama and, and watching, you know, the news with the negative news and um, you know, all of the soap opera TV shows, they're watching that exterior world that they're then replicating inside yes. of that drama and debate yeah. and, and being yeah. aware that that's what they're programming in yeah. as their reality. Yeah, beautiful, yes. I and, No, go ahead, please. Oh, uh, no, no, I was just going to say I, I love how you share these concepts in ways that people can really relate to and understand and, mm. and are so clear but so powerful. Michelle, it, it's about, you know, as a microbehavioural neuroscientist, I'm always looking for the tiny things that will actually affect how the brain works. Now, just a little minute ago, you made a comment like, we've just got to see if we can change things. Now, that was you doing a hand gesture, so we're going from here to here, now, you doing that gesture at that time when you said change things, has Alan's brain follow you visually? Which means you're stimulating my visual brain, which has less emotion in it. So you're inadvertently getting me to use my eyes more, my emotions less, so I can hear more. Does that make sense? It does. One of the things I've learned personally from you, and I keep trying to practice now, which is quite funny, um, is sometimes when I'm going to go and nod, because that's what I do as a re reflex to when people are talking. Um, one of the things you've shared is about being still and just using your eyes and your ears. And, and I was doing it, and then I realised that people might think that the screen had frozen. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, oh, I'm, I'm, I keep practicing these um, yeah. tools that you've shared because, yes, um, the, for me, one of the things I really understood about it was that shift from in that choice point we mentioned earlier, being in an emotional kind of reactive state mm -hmm. to having your eyes and your ears as the input of information, if you like, and then coming from that choice point. Yeah. What are your eyes telling you? What are your ears telling you? And then in that space, making the decision yeah. as opposed to having the emotions kind yeah. of direct the decisions. Yeah. Michelle, we, we live in a world, particularly during COVID and post-COVID, uh, and I say that we are still in what's called, what I call crisis fatigue. And as cri in crisis fatigue, have we just frozen? Um. No. You, you, you've been going in and out a little bit, but not too much to stop. So I, I kind of was talking right. or the camera came to me. Okay. okay. Um, the, the, 
the combination of small actions and your head nod. Now your head nod, when I've finished saying something, is a well-placed head nod. Now that time you <laughs> head nod and you raise your eyebrows and smile, which is more approval. I go, thanks for that one. Yeah. But if we can head nod near the end of somebody's comment, once we've got the meaning of it, it'll be more important for somebody. If I, if I can, in a, a not a bouncy, jerky way, but if I can use my hands just to redirect your eyes, the, the movement of your eye out of the center of the socket, and in the center of the socket is where we have the fight and flight response, where we get aggressive, hostile, stressed. But if I can sit as I do slightly off center, slightly angled, with my eye connecting with you, but not in the center of the socket. Because in the center of the socket, it can fire my fight and flight response. But out of the center of the socket, that doesn't happen. So if indeed I can keep you eye moving, and particularly moving away from the center. So if you watch most people when they're talking, they, they gesture toward. And I go, oh, don't do that. You know, that's where I want to get. And the minute I move towards you, your fight and flight response kicks in. But if I can just gesture away from the center and you follow, it's a much more calming phenomenon. And you'll notice that I roll the hand not bounce it. Now, people watching are going to be horrified now. I've made them aware of how often we bounce because <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be driven crazy <laughs> by how many times people bounce their gestures. Oh, um, you look at politicians that are always going like and that. Politicians gesture to the camera yeah. and they're gesturing at the person. Now, they think it seems powerful and convincing, and it might be but it's firing the fight and flight response. And a politician who does that, people are either going to like them or not like them. Now, the people who are addicted to the cortisol and adrenaline, they'll go, yeah, he's powerful, I like that. And they'll join them in that agitated, high energy state, which by the way, is often triggered by too much sugar. Yes, sugar is another just, biological trigger. Just want to throw that in. <laughs> well, Alan, um, I, I really love what you're saying and as, as this final point around, you know, even if I'm turning my body in a meeting situation or on a Zoom yeah. call, if instead of um, being straight onto camera, yeah. if I turn yeah. my body and then what it's doing is that it's not triggering. If I'm here like this, it can trigger the fight or flight. But if I turn sideways, then it moves my eye out of the centre of the socket yeah. and then it can't trigger the fight or flight. So even if I have emotions then coming up in a situation, it won't be those types of emotions and I can then again react from a different That's space. Right. There, there are so many. I, I know that I could actually do hours upon hours of conversation with you <laughs> to talk about this stuff. And I know that this has been such an action-packed show with so much fabulous insight. If people wanted to find out more about you, what's the best way of contacting you? Oh, the, the simplest and most accessible is through LinkedIn. And we have large amounts of posts on LinkedIn. There's hundreds of pages of stuff around all sorts of different things from how the brain works. Um, how we negotiate, how we have conversations, how we remain calm, composed, and not get ourselves into a, a stressed state. And it's linked in, and there's, I think there's, a, there's probably 20 short three to six minute videos on all different small behaviors on LinkedIn. And that would be oh, the best one. Fabulous, and yeah. Alan, and unfortunately, Alan, the Alan is a double L A N, Parker P A R K E R, to make sure. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, yeah, the camera is um, the 
connection is um, freezing and stuff a little bit again. But just to wind up, Alan, um, I know that you will have an interesting insight again for this final question around if you were to tell your younger self or give some young advice to your younger self, what would that be? Oh, that... Um, the speculating into the future negatively, which is called worry, is always hallucination and of no value whatsoever. That if we are going into the future, go into the future to plan, to vision, to goal set, to imagine, to speculate in the positive. Because we move to where we put our attention. And if we mm -hmm. put our attention in the present and explore the future, goal, plan, dream, possibility, we will naturally automatically move toward it. That would be it. I didn't, I didn't really learn that and get it in the first 40 years of my life. And that would be what I'd give. Yeah, stop worrying, be present and consider what you want, not what you're scared of. What incredible advice, what really heartfelt advice. And um, to anybody watching, you know, whatever age, um, I hope that you really take that those fabulous insights and this fabulous insight into account. But for now, thank you so, so much for being on the show today, Alan. Michelle, it has been a joy. Thank you and a lot of fun. <laughs> it's been, it's a, been fun. a real hoot. <laughs> it has. Um, so to everybody watching, I hope that you have again enjoyed, um, like I said, the Yoda of NLP, neuroscience and um, a master of everything to do with micro behavioral science and somebody that has been a real treat to have on the show. But for now, that's the end of the show for today. So from my heart to your heart, be great, be fabulous and be you. <laughs>